I stood there in a daze, bewildered and confused. Bullets, or what I presumed were bullets, zipped through the foliage above me, making a funny cracking sound, and it took me a ridiculously long time to realise I was being shot at. When it dawned on me, I dropped to the ground and crawled into a shally, shallow gully. Then I cautiously poked my head over the bank and attempted to assess where the firing was coming from. But, learning nothing, I just aimed my rifle to the front. I had never fired a rifle in anger before, and suddenly I began to wonder. Was I allowed to open fire? They won't think I'm wasting ammunition, will they? Will they shout at me if I shoot? Will I be charged? I pondered these weighty qu questions and eventually decided to fire. I tentatively, tentatively squeezed the trigger and the shot rang out. To my relief, I found that no one had objected. Still worried, I glanced to my left at the mag gunner. He was firing furiously and taking absolutely no notice of me. So I decided I should carry on. Feeling much better, I squeezed the trigger again. And again, oblivious of the intense din that was exploding in my ears. Then, as suddenly as it had started, the firing stopped. We withdrew a hundred metres or so, and I wondered what was going on. What's happening? I asked the burly rifleman next to me. The lynx is coming in for a strike. We must find some good cover and keep our heads down. We ducked behind the shelter of some rocks and waited. Shortly, there came the roar of an aircraft approaching. It flew across the front of our position at treetop level, reminding me somehow of a large grey shark sliding in for an attack. Two bombs tumbled earthward and detonated in a brilliant explosion in front of us. I felt myself wince involuntarily. Immediately we stood up and resumed sweeping toward the contact area, sweeping towards the contact area. Gelatinous embryo-like lumps were burning as we advanced across the green veld. Corpus Seward spotted what looked to me like a bundle of rags beneath a bush. In an instant, his rifle was at his shoulder and he fired three or four quick shots. The bundle grunted as it rolled over. I should say, the bundle grunted and as it rolled over, a communist AK-47 rifle clattered to the side. I was astonished. So that was a gorilla. The bundle had seemed so inoffensive. I studied the body curiously. Still smouldering napalm had bored ugly holes into the flesh which gave off a sickly sweet smell. The skull had been shattered by a bullet and brains were oozing through the scalp in a riot of blood and gore. The mouth was fixed in a grimace of death while the eyes stared upwards as if in a trance. So this was death. It was gruesome. It was messy. I suddenly wondered if RLI soldiers looked like this when they were killed. The sweep continued and we discovered three more bodies, killed either by the Lynx airstrike or the K-car 20mm cannon, or both. I soon learned the practice of immediately shooting at anything suspicious, regardless of whether it was obviously dead or not. If in doubt, shoot. That was the way he stayed alive. That was an excerpt from Chris Cox's book, Fire Force, which has recently been republished, and I'm very glad to say Chris He's sat in the HR studio with me right now. Chris, that is an amazing read. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, when we spoke last week, I said to you, I thought, man, people have been telling me to read Fire Force since I joined the Pares back in 2000. And I never, it's just for some reason, it's one of those areas that never irked me interest. I wish it had because I've been, read, been reading Firefox frantically for the last few weeks, frantically by, because I couldn't get, I didn't want to get away from the book. I couldn't stop reading it. Um, it dawned on me how little I knew of the situation in Africa at the time. Yeah, yeah. But also how the stories that many of which are documented in your book, how in, how incredible they are, and even like they just stay relevant. The type of warfare that was being conducted, the counterinsurgency operations there, which was relatively new at the time, hot off the back of um, you know Malaya, uh, and uh, it's like the it's like the the not even the forgotten war over here, it's almost like the unknown war, unless you had served with, you know, South Africans or Zimb uh, Rhodesians and Zimbabweans. Um, can you can you give a, uh, an insight as to what was going on in Rhodesia at the time, uh, at the time you were conscripted at the RLA? Sure can, yeah. A um, little bit of background. Uh, Rhodesia, uh, at the time, 1965, when the Prime Minister Ian Smith unilaterally declared independence from Britain, uh, because Britain was wanting to give independence to to Rhodesia, which w would have meant black majority rule, um, which is why Ian Smith d 
declared independence. Um, Rhodesia was a British colony, and like all the other colonies of the time, Zambia, Malawi, we're all getting independence. Uh, repercussions were fast and furious. Britain imposed sanctions, and straight away the UN imposed international sanctions on Rhodesia, which became effectively a, a kind of pariah state, um, 65. The first um, nationalist uh, guerrilla uh, operations began properly in about 1966, and Zanla and Zipra, the two liberation uh, armies, were all based in Zambia, to the north, across the Zambezi River, and they started... Um, sending guerrillas into Rhodesia to begin the, the armed struggle, as it was known. Uh, and it, it sort of increased um, slowly. Uh, 1968 was a bit of a watershed moment in terms of the, the Bush War. It, it was never regarded as anything other than a, a, a terrorist kind of insurgency. Um, it, it was never seen as a sort of war per se. And, and the, what the Rhodesians did was really what they called border control operations. So it was just manning the borders of the country, which was essentially the Zambezi River to the north, bordering Zambia. And then later, when Mozambique in 1975 got independence from Port uh, Portugal, Portugal basically lost all the African possessions in 1975, which was in our neck of the woods, Angola and Mozambique. Uh, the war then... Uh, Mozambique with Samor Michel uh, as the president offered Zanla a base. So that opened up an extra 1,200 kilometers of border, um, which the Rhodesians were forced to police. Um, Operation Hurricane in 1972 was the first kind of major um, incursion from Mozambique. Uh, by Zanla guerrillas, and they started targeting white farmers, um, police stations, uh, and essentially flooding the northeast of the country. Um, the landmine became their weapon of choice, and it absolutely wreaked havoc. We, we, the Rhodesians were no way um, knew how to handle that. Yeah. Can I ask what the reason for targeting the farmers was? What was their, what was their aim by the targeting the way they did? They were regarded well. They they were uh, part of the white economy, um, and if they could get the uh, Rhodesia was a farming based economy. Um, if they could get the, the the white farmers off the land, um, they would achieve their objectives, and um, which they did in large areas. They managed to evict the farmers or kill them. Yeah, um, and so yeah, that 1972 was when Operation Hurricane um, was opened. In 1976, when I joined, or when I was conscripted, um, there was a flood of incursions from across, in from Mozambique, in the east, into the east of the country, and what was called Operation Thrasher, and then Operation Repulse in the southeast of the country. Uh, those operational areas were were opened. So, 1976 was, I was regarded as the third and final phase of the war from 1965 UDI, 1972 the Operation Hurricane opens and then 1976 uh, the rest of the country basically opened up to, to uh, guerrilla incursions. And then it got serious. Um, National Service, which was um, uh, all white uh, boys, had to do one, uh, 12 months National Service. Um, that was increased fairly soon to 18 months and then two years after 1976. Uh, yeah, so 1976 till the, the end of the war in 1980, the war increased kind of exponentially as um, the guerrillas really just flooded the country and uh, in their endeavor to, to take it over with a, with a military solution. One of the things that the, the book really opened my eyes to um, uh, was I think we again we spoke of it before. I had this mis misconception or incorrect perception that uh, that it was 
it, it was a, a, a white versus black kind of war. Uh, in a sim I think that's just my na well, absolutely my naivety. Um, also, sort of not understanding it, the relationship between that and, and a, apartheid in South Africa at the time. But one of the things the book has really opened my eyes to is that it absolutely wasn't the case, or it doesn't seem that way. And you had, and there were units like the the Rhodesian African Rifles, entirely black units, and there were there was a a lot of there were a lot of military on you know with the Rhodesian forces who were who were black themselves. But when the, when the, um, wh why did the national service not apply to the black population? Why did it only apply to, is that, can you, can you explain that? If you yeah, don't mind? yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, although apartheid wasn't a, a, a formalized policy of, of the Rhodesians, um, it was a racially divided um, a, a society. Um, that was changing slowly. And even Ian Smith recognised that it needed to change, and he even accepted, in the later the later years, that majority rule, i.e., black, was going to happen. Um, <clears throat> the, the the Rhodesian forces were the vast majority of the Rhodesian forces were black, as you mentioned. The Salu Scots, for example, um, which was the largest regiment. Uh, regular regiment um, in the war. I mean, they were 80% black. They had they had a strength of over 2,000 people, by far and away the largest uh, regiment. Um, national service started originally for whites. Um, they felt uh, that the the blacks were um, filling the the regular ranks of the Rhodesia Africa Rifles, and they didn't need them. Apart from which, they didn't trust them. Uh, to get blacks into national service. It happened later, I think in 1978 or 79, blacks were conscripted. Was the, was the trust an issue because of the fear that you get guerrillas being embedded in, in any doubt? Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, 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 and that did happen. That did happen, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas the regular troops of, of the Rhodesian African Rifles, Salu Scouts, they joined up, they were volunteers, um, and they joined up... If, essentially, because it was a job. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. And at what point did what point were you conscripted? What what was the situation then specifically? And uh, yeah, what year was that then? I I received my little brown envelope <laughs> in November 1975, just as I was doing my A levels, and I was told to report to Cranbourne Barracks in Salisbury or Harare now on the 8th of January. To do to do one year, yeah. Eighteen, sorry. Eighteen years old. Yeah. I just turned eighteen. Yeah, I turned eighteen in November. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got got the call up papers. Yeah. Well, yeah. One of the things you, uh, you you mentioned in the book, you touch on is that, uh, you, you, and even I think even now maybe, you, you don't you, you weren't sure about what you thought about the war, you know, and uh, the thought of not uh, the thought of avoiding national service crossed your mind because of. I, I suppose was that cause, just because the the morality of it that you were questioning, or you didn't understand it. What was what was that from? No, I, it was certainly on the morality. Um, I came from a very liberal kind of family. Um, they didn't like Ian Smith and and his policies, and um, a lot of uh, white kids were avoiding uh, national service, ostensibly being sent out the country to go to university or just leaving. I mean, lots, lots. Um, uh, in the end, uh, and I was going to do that. I mean, I didn't agree with the the policies of the Rhodesian Front in, in Smith and um, 18 at the time, but I, I, morally I felt they were wrong. Um, but in the end, it was your duty. And uh, I thought, well, let's do it. Got to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were your expectations when you joined? What, what do you think you are going to head into? Did, did you get options of what trade you go into? You did to to an extent. Um, your training uh, very much like a British Army. Um, I think it was twenty twenty weeks. Uh, the first six weeks were uh, basic training. I think what the Yanks would call boot camp type stuff. Then the second six weeks were classical warfare training, and the third period was counterinsurgency training. Um, at the time when we joined, the the war. <laughs> was simmering. It had been ticking along, um, and it was only in April, May 1976 that there was a massive incursion, which is when 
I had my first contact, the one you read out. Um, and that's when the country was absolutely flooded with Zanla guerrillas. Prior to that, um, it had been a steady infiltration. Fire Force, the concept of Fire Force was as a tactic was developed in about 1974. And it was proving highly successful. So the guerrillas were on the back foot the whole time um, until April, May, 76, as I say, when sheer numbers, they started um, flooding the country. So my expectations when I joined, I thought, well, I've been sent to the RLI only because well, the RLI was a regular uh, battalion, um, and but they had uh, r recruiting issues. They w weren't getting enough um, recruits, volunteers, so they had to dig into the pool of conscripts, which was just by um, fortune, I guess, um, I ended up going to Cranbourne Barracks, the RLI, rather than um, the, where everyone else went, which was in Bulawayo to the Rhodesia Regiment, the Territorial um, National, uh, who also handled the National Service troops. What um, what kind of percentage of of the forces were was con were conscripts at the time, or what were what percentage sort of regular? Okay, the 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 Rhodesia Regiment, which was a territorial or the reserve, had ten battalions. Um, not all of them were all based on um, r regional centres. So, for example, 10th Battalion would come from Guello or uh, 1st Battalion came from Salisbury, or, you know, 4th uh, Battalion entirely. Um, territorial battalions, they were never all of them up to full strength at any one time. But um, I would say that in all, Rhodesians could probably count on about 40,000 troops all in. That includes, um, I mean, the regular component were, were way under 10,000. So the territorials made up the vast majority. Yeah, And they did what was known as six weeks in, six weeks out from 1976 onwards. So um, they had all done their national service and then um, would have to do their territorial call-ups, which ended up being six weeks in, six weeks as a civilian, six weeks in. So uh, and that proved a massive drain because a lot of people just left the country. Um, you, you can't r run your life like that. I mean, six, six weeks in the army and six weeks as a civilian. Um, so that was a. That's why they were always under strength. Um, one of the reasons. And as the war progressed, it got worse. Yeah. So, yeah. so the reasons in the end were just sort of beaten by sheer numbers. So yeah. So I mean, that's that's a crazy concept. Six weeks because it's not just. Six weeks out of uh, sorry, six being six weeks in the army. That's been six weeks of actually fighting in a war. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What was it before that? Then? Well, it, it was kind of like six weeks every. Well, I mean, probably six weeks a year in '65, um, and then then at two six weeks as two six weeks as you know, and increased until such time as became almost like. I mean, a lot of them became regular soldiers because of it. You know. Mm. Yeah, what did the uh, what did the guerrilla um, modus operandi become when when it was realised that fire for that fire force is highly effective that counterinsurgency way of operating was highly effective, so essentially it was uh, uh, and correct me wrong it was observers small amounts of observers in in guerrilla in potentially guerrilla controlled areas observing uh, enemy activity or suspected enemy activity report it back and then RLI or whichever unit would jump into the jump into helicopters or planes and get in there fast either jumping out of a helicopter or jumping out of a plane with a parachute yeah um engage the enemy and then get and, and then bug out yeah um what, what was their response to that tactic one so one was obviously f numbers sheer flooding of numbers in how else were they trying to combat you they had their own um, modus operandi or, or standard operating procedures for when Fire Force engaged them. Um, they knew that they didn't want to um, fight because of our air power. Um, so that was, a lot of them did, uh, but generally it was to keep low, try and avoid the scene, um, and duck out of there as soon as they could um, to regroup wherever. Um, but as I say, that, that um, as, as they got bolder with time, 
they would um, ac actively uh, combat the fire force operation. But, you know, and although they way outnumbered uh, us ground troops, we had air power, we had the helicopters, we had the, we had the napalm and the, um, you know, the Dakotas and that kind of thing. So uh, we had a massive advantage. But, um, yeah, they, they had tactics. Uh, f for example, like in Vietnam, they, they worked out when the helicopters were most vulnerable. Um, they'd sit on the edge of a, um, an LZ and wait till it landed um, and then ha have a go from there. Um, yeah, the, as I say, it, it did... Um, but sorry, yeah, getting back to the tactics of the of the, the guerrillas, you're quite right. They they infiltrated all the communal lands, which were the tribal lands. In fact, the Rhodesian government called them the tribal trust lands. They were entrusted to the tribal people, the majority of the population, the povo, uh, which is a Portuguese word meaning the people, as they were known. And um, they can, uh, operated absolutely on masked tactics, Mars Little Red Book. They all had Mars Little Red Book. Um, I mean, I had a whole library of them at one stage. What what Little Red Book? Chairman Mao. Oh, Mao's. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, swimming with the people and that kind of thing. That's what they did. Um, they needed to get their food from the, from the, from the people, from the masses, um, and then they indoctrinated them. Um, they ruled by terror. Um, depending on where the area was. I mean, and if there was a family, for example, that had a son or a brother in the security forces in the Rhodesian army or the police, that family would be taken out, killed. Um, yeah, they're pretty ruthless, um, how they went about things. Um, but they, they were extremely good in mixing with the the population. And, you know, the classic of, in the day, they take off the unit the military uniforms and mix as uh, a civilian, you know, wearing your jeans and T-shirt. <clears throat> um, the Sulu scouts, uh, almost all of our call-outs, our successful operations, were as a result of Sulu scouts uh, calling us out. Uh, Sulu scouts, they operated OPs in the tribal areas or... Um, more often than not, uh, pseudo guerrilla tactics. So that's what they were renowned for. So the Sulu scouts would go in as dressed up like guerrillas um, and may, try to make contact with a guerrilla group in an area. Um, so undercover. You talk about like you talk like in Labour yeah, yeah. undercover. Yeah, yeah. So Sulu scout. Just to remind you know, like for all, all, like eighty percent black yeah. unit. They would. They would go in, pretend to be a guerrilla, to yeah. identify. To ident so that would be to identify where that there was there was enemy presence there. Yeah. And what would they do then? They would they extract and call in a mission. They would then call us. Yeah. They would then get hold of the nearest fire force and say, "All right, we've got a sighting here. We've got uh, fifty Zanla or twenty or whatever. Um, give us the lockstat, and we'd go in there." Yeah. I mean, incredibly brave what they did. I mean, and because they had to be one step ahead because the guerrillas. I mean, they had specific way of dressing. Um, they had specific code words. So one false move, and uh, the whole thing was compromised, and they'd be dead. Um, the other success, uh, the other way of identifying uh, where the guerrillas were, apart from the OPs and the Saluscout pseudo operation, was various clever tricks that the special branch, um, uh, the BSAP, the police special branch, were able to do. Um, they would do things like bugging uh, transistor radios in farm stores. Those are always pr uh, prizes that the guerrillas would come into an area, um, raid a store, and uh, a special branch would have inserted a little tracking device in one of the radios or a couple of pounds of TNT or something. So when the guy switched it on, boom. Um, but uh, th those are called road runners, um, little tracking devices, extremely effective. We, so we called out a lot of those um, operations um, that had been tracked down with special branch uh, tracking devices. Yeah. It's extremely, um, uh, what's the word, uh, sophisticated ways of operating. From the, uh, When you think about the time it was, sort of 70s, and mm. where it was, mm. 
it you know it's not exactly a developed country with those kind of you would think would have those kind of track capabilities or would have units to do that again in commas undercover mm, mm, mm. that's like a hybrid sort of non-war way of operating in a war to in to get into what the enemy's doing it's, uh, uh, it's pretty incredible that yeah absolutely um i mean our special branch were amazing they really were uh and then the other way was um when we got a capture um an enemy capture he would then be turned <clears throat> as they call it turned to the rhodesian side um never with any coercion there was never torture involved um, and the special branch were absolute masters at doing that and then obviously he had a whole lot of information about uh, where the guerrillas were and that sort of thing i mean a lot of the Salus scouts themselves were um, turned they had been guerrillas uh, prior to turning and becoming Salus scouts why was it so without the use of um, uh, uh, torture tactics why were they why were they able to turn them so effectively was it simply because the guerrillas would see the light and go yeah yeah okay yeah yeah they've been completely brainwashed yeah all money yeah the offer of money yeah 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 where were they getting? Where were they, you mentioned mines early on. You mentioned that their, their weapon of choice at the time or their tactic was was laying mines. Where were they getting that? From? Where were they getting the, those resources from? Like predominantly um, uh, communist bloc countries. So Zana was supported by the Chinese um, and the Soviets to some extent, and Zipra um, in Zambia were particularly supported by um, the Soviet bloc, uh, East Germany. A lot of the, the, the camouflage uh, with East German uh, rice pattern. Um, the, and their weapons, obviously, all AK-47s, SKSs, RPGs, whole range, and the, the, la the landmines, yeah. Did they, ever have, uh, did they ever have any form of air asset at any time? No, uh, they didn't, but um, the Zambian Air Force did, and the Mozambican Air Force did. They had MiGs. They both had MiGs. Um, but they never... You utilize them uh, except no, uh, on occasion in Mozambique. For example, when we were doing our cross-border um, preemptive raids into Mozambique or Zambia. Occasionally they used them, but they were scared of losing those to Rhodesian Air Force. I mean, I'm, I'm, the MiGs would have outfought our antiquated um, hawker har har hunters and um, vampires. I mean, for goodness sake, that's what well, we had. Uh, but, yeah, they were afraid to, to use the, the air, air assets. They also had tanks, um, T-54, 55s, um, and w now and again we came up against those, but only in uh, Zambia or Mozambique. We had nothing. We had the old ferret armoured car. That was what we had. Yeah. yeah. Would, so <clears throat> tanks couldn't speak. Cause those, those incursions into Mozambique and Zambia, they came later on in your time, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm just remembering from reading the book. Um, so can we talk about that? So when you when on those incursions, uh, how much more significant was the level of risk? Was your was your ability was your supply chain was your ability to to get out um, much much uh, much dim diminished compared to when you operate in Rhodesia? And also, when you come up with thing, against things like tanks, right? As, uh, you know, Rhodesian light infantry for a reason. You ain't, got like, you ain't got a lot of heavy kit to deal with stuff like that. How did you? Uh, how are you dealing with it, coming up against a tank? Personally, I never came up against tanks. Thank goodness. But um, some of the guys did, and effectively they just ran away, um, the, uh, withdrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just get out. I suppose, yeah, you forget it's kind of insurgency. I, I, I suppose they, that's the, there's the beauty of not having to hold ground. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got a bridge too far. Yeah, let's get out. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the what about the, uh, the so the assets you're supposed to, to get out? I mean, you you know you, you would get in, get dropped off in helicopters, I assume, or something. Well, unless you were going on, on, on by land on those incursions, or you would jump in, perhaps. And it's much easier to get into a place by those methods than it is to get out. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and depending on how far in country the the, the, the target was, uh, so for example, um, Chimoya, which was about a hundred kilometres across the border, um, Mozambique. Yeah, into Mozambique, um, about halfway to Beira from from Mtali. Uh So that was within um, 
easy to get into and um, it quite often we would send in what we called a land tail which is really a convoy of trucks um, and armored cars and maybe some artillery 25 pounders that sort of thing would would act, go in but obviously after the action had started so as not to uh, compromise the element of surprise um, and they would go in there to um, a provide reinforcements um, extra firepower um, ammunition and take out um, casualties weaponry you know armaments whatever that kind of thing um, but generally it was all done um, through helicopters so a big raid um, into Zambia or Mozambique we would use the entire air forces um, helicopter capability so there'd probably be about depending whether the South Africans were helping us at the time or not, because a lot of their uh, Alouettes were South African Air Force, uh, we'd probably have about 30 to 40 Alouette threes, which were troop-carrying slash gunships. And they would hold four, four, they could hold four, four. RLI, uh, well, anyone, you yeah. would call them sticks, right? Stick, yeah. So when you, you operate in sticks of four. Yeah. And then what was the bigger unit above that then? Was it, did you have multiples, platoons? We had a troop, yeah, which was the same as a platoon. Got you. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean... In the old days, it was companies, um, platoon, section, half section, which was a stick. Fire team, you yeah. call it, yeah. Yeah, stick, yeah, yeah same yeah. thing, yeah, yeah. And the only reason we had four-man sticks was because an Alouette three could only take four heavily armed soldiers. So, you know, that was a carrying capacity of an Alouette three. Uh, it changed a little bit um, later in the war, 70, late 78, um, the Israeli, some Israeli managed to convince the Rhodesians to buy a whole lot of broken down um, <laughs> Bell UH-1s, Hueys. <laughs> and I think, I think the Rhodesians, we bought about eight or nine of them from this Israeli businessman. And uh, they had to use three or four of them as spares to, keep the, to get the other four going. So, <laughs> but that definitely, those, um, those Hueys, or I think the Rhodesians called them, Cheetahs, uh, Hueys, basically. Yeah, the, I mean, that included the increased the carrying capacity enormously. And those are used primarily or only for external operations. I think they could carry 12 or, or more. So, you know, with three times the carrying capacity of an Alouette. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, we would use 30, 40 Alouette. Um, it meant that the fire force capability in Rhodesia was temporarily. Um, put on hold basically because every all the air assets were used externally um, probably about a seven or eight Dakotas to carry paratroopers uh, and then all the um, air support the, the the Hawker Hunters the Canberra bombers um, and vampires how uh, how much planning was so let's so for one of those sort of full full air force uh, raids into Mozambique Zambia to uh, I'm assuming onto camps right onto yeah. guerrilla camps yes how, how much uh, how much planning would that take how much notice would you get were these things that can be done within like a couple organising in a couple of days to go we're going no or, no 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 they, they they took a lot of planning um, and it was always done on an equal the air force and the army both had um, a commander. Um, Quite often the Air Force commander was the overall commander, uh, but it would take a good month or so to, to coordinate the whole thing, at least. You know, massive operation. I mean, it, 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 you're looking at sort of mobilizing the entire Air Force for the operation. Um, where, where was the intelligence coming from? On, as an, just as an example, where was the intelligence coming from that you're going to, where the, one, there's a camp in this place, two, it's got, it's, it's got these resources, these these troops there, these, these guerrillas there, uh, this is what it's doing out of there. Where was that intelligence coming from, um, generally? Primarily from um, from captures. You know, uh, get the whole history of where they'd been trained, um, where they'd um, been recruited or, or abducted from um, in Rhodesia. Uh, so, yeah, from um, captures, from um, uh, uh, photo reconnaissance, High flying Canberras, fairly organised. I mean, they, they, uh, with with the photography, photo recce, the Canberras, and then lastly, um, either SAS or Salu Scout operations. Basically, one or two man teams going in there 
doing reconnaissance operations into the camps. Yeah, and some far. I mean, some were as far afield as Tanzania and northern Mozambique. Um, and you get guys, some of these Sulu scouts. I mean, uh, Chris Schulenberg, who is a, one of the most highly decorated people in the war, he's a Sulu scout. Um, he and his black um, Sulu scout partner, I mean, they'd, they'd go in there, they'd be inserted by um, uh, Halo. Hey. Yeah, uh, into the middle of Mozambique or where, mid Tanzania even, um, and then on your own. And they'd come back and say, well, we found this camp. It's got 10,000 gorillas, and there you go. Yeah, so they were, yeah, they were quite brave. <laughs> I believe it's incredible. It's just, it's just, it's just, just incredible, the kind, of, uh, the kind of stuff that went on. Um, <laughs> what, what's a... What was the biggest camp that you raided that you were involved in? That sort of those obviously those uh, across border incursions. Yeah. <clears throat> Me personally, um, I I did a raid. I was involved in a raid with uh, together with the SAS um, Rhodesian SAS in 1978. Um, it was three three camps. We hit three camps at once um, in Zambia. Um, there was one camp in, known as FC Camp, that, uh, which was on the outskirts of Lusaka, that probably had about three to 4,000 um, Zipra recruits and, and troops, soldiers. Uh, then there was another one called, or r right up in the north of Zambia, that also had the same amount, three, 4,000, maybe more recruits and trained troops. That, that was um, this, uh, SAS took that one out. And then the RLI, we had one further to the south, just north of the Zambezi River. Again, probably three to 4,000. So you're probably looking at altogether 15,000, maybe more, maybe more. I mean, I know that the Chamoya operation, which um, three commando, two commander, and the SAS were involved in. I was on leave at the time, um, and such was the secrecy that we didn't know about it till literally a couple of days. We knew that there was something in the offing, but I mean, I couldn't put my leave on hold. Well, I didn't want to. I would have stayed had I known. But um, that probably had in the region of 20,000 recruits, maybe more. I don't know. Very difficult. Um, and yeah, I mean, there were, I remember that 196 Rhodesian soldiers went in to take them out, um, obviously with air support. To take 20,000 out? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, such was the the confidence in the air force. Uh, I mean, they had absolute soul. They they were not contested apart from um, ground fire anti aircraft um, operation. I mean, we we did lose. We lost aircraft. We lost a few vampires shot down. A couple of hurricanes. We we lost Dakotas. I remember one taken out by an RPG taking off from a Mozambican strip after a raid. A lone RPG-7 gunner sat at the end of the runway and took him out. Um, and, yeah, and Alouettes were regularly taken out. So they, they had a, a lot of high-powered weaponry in, in terms of anti-aircraft facilities. But the Rhodesians had total air control. Um, total, total. So without that, there was no ways we could have... So, I mean, what they did, well, Ch Chamoya, for example, it, well, the HR was... 800 or whenever, when we knew that the whole camp would be on parade. We knew that we had that intelligence. And that's when the um, the Canberras and the Hunters, they were struck. And I mean, that that alone took out a couple of thousand. Um, so, yeah, eh, they weren't all, all successful, all the raids. I mean, they were, they were, a lot of them were compromised. And there's talk that there was a mole um, high up in... Um, Rhodesian intelligence, um, possibly in special branch, or the CIO is also with the Central Intelligence Organization. Um, they think there was a mole um, British guy um, who was reporting everything, basically, back to the Brits and the Americans. Yeah. And the and so and, and, and that would that information would go full circle back to the guerrillas. Yeah. How would that happen? And I'm, I'm assuming, seeing as you're, you're the official RLI historian as well, aren't you? Well, I was, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
if there is an official, but I was a historian, yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of the RLI books, yeah. So you've got a name pinned to this guy, haven't you? I, suspect. I certainly have. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me. Um, can we talk about the can we talk more about the camps? Is that all right? Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that the demographic of those recruits was pretty young. I mean, we're talking like guerrilla warfare. We're not talking. You can only join the military when you're 16. Yeah. And you can only go on operations when you're yeah. 18. Uh, what's it, what's the youngest? Uh, you know what? It's not a comfortable question actually. But I will ask it. Uh, I'll ask it because I, I, I say because I've, I've I've been asked a similar thing myself. Yeah. From, from my own experiences, what, what's the youngest combatant you ever came up uh, came up against? With the enemy, I would say fifteen, sixteen, maybe. Yeah, yeah. They were. They're very young. Um, most of the sort of rank and file were kids like us. You know, fifteen, sixteen. Um, I don't think they sent them um, on ops until they were over sixteen. Um, I mean, one of the major methods of recruiting was to go and kidnap a whole school. In Rhodesia, and then marched them across the border, and those would be school kids from uh, high school, senior school. So they'd be from 13, 14 up, um, and then they'd spend two, three years in the camps, being trained, indoctrinated, um, and then eventually sent in, in into Rhodesia. Yeah. You pull your chair in just slightly, just could we get a bit, a bit closer to that mic? Cheers, bud. Um, and, and what was the <coughs> What was the camp? What were the camps like? What 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 was kind of the pattern of life there? What was the layout like? Were these were these big camps? Are we talking about twenty thousand there? Um, or or you, you spoke about the three camps that you raided, which is about fifteen fifteen thousand across the three. Oh well, you were part of those raids or, onto one of the camps. What what were they like? What do these things look like? They were massive, um, and they they covered a lot of ground. Um, I mean, some of them would cover. Uh, 20 to 25, maybe more, square miles. Um, so you're looking at at least five miles by five miles or more. And th there wasn't just one camp. It was a whole lot of series of camps, like satellite camps, um, mainly for defensive purposes. Um, but they had their regular barracks and they had, um, you know, parade grounds and... Obviously, defence was a massive thing, so there were a lot of uh, the whole place was ringed with trenches, um, anti-aircraft emplacements, bunkers, um, that sort of thing. Um, they had armories, they had hospitals, um, camouflaged as much as possible from the air. So, you know, you fly over in a helicopter, you might not even know that there's a camp there. Um, that's how how well they managed to camouflage it. But they were fairly complacent. Um, and that's why they had their parade grounds and they, that, that kind of thing, um, until the Rhodesians started hitting them and then they were forced to move the camps further and further inland, away from the Rhodesian border, um, which made it more difficult for us because of the, the distances involved. Um, but, yeah, they, they were pretty well uh, well stocked um, Stocked with food, ammunition. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were absolutely amazing, amazing places. How would they? How would they camouflage such a big place from from the sky? How would they? How would, any unusual method? Uh, Not really. Because um, uh, I've heard stories from vi in, from vi in Vietnam. Yeah. Where um, they would, where the uh, the Viet Cong would, for example, well, they would they would weave the jungle canopy over so an area where they had to cut it down yeah. where for whatever a, a, a main supply route a, a parade ground for for example whatever they would then weave the canopy over so you couldn't see that there was yeah. a route they would do do that anything like that going on yeah there was um, they had a lot of um, they even had Vietnamese um, advisors um, there were a lot of Cuban advisors, um, Soviet advisors, Chinese advisors. So they they had all these guys, particularly on the weapons systems. But um, yeah, I mean they they did all those kind of tricks. But most of the um, barrack rooms, for example, were not brick and mortar um, or tin roof. A lot of them were, but um, a lot of them were thatch or bashers, as I think that's the word that we lifted from a layer. Um, and those are very difficult to see anyway. Um, from from the air, so yeah, but it's very difficult to hide ten or twenty thousand people. 
very difficult. So, I mean, although they did do a lot of um, camouflaging um, various techniques, um, we always knew where they were. Yeah. yeah. You went, uh, your your journey uh, through, through, uh, through, well, your military career, shall we say, unusual. Um, you, you started as a conscript. You weren't sure about whether you want to be involved in it or not. Um, and I think the the book also articulates that you felt that afterwards as well when you left. You were still not maybe I don't know you 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 put maybe something down. What not sure about how, what to think of your involvement in it, whether it was right or wrong. But at the same time, you ended up signing up as a regular, didn't you? And getting promoted and becoming a I think you were a platoon commander at one point or commander of the platoon. I did, yeah. It was simply because there were no officers and sergeants left. <laughs> They'd all been shot or wounded. <laughs> what, what, so talk to me about that journey, Chris. Like, what, what was, what, how were you developing as an individual? Because yeah. the military does incredible things to people, and then, then you throw in operations. If you're lucky enough to be part of significant operations, that doesn't. I say incredible. I'm not. I'm not insinuating that this. It can back me positive or negative, right? Incred, yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible isn't necessarily a positive word, right? But yeah, talk to me about that journey. We're, we're, well, as I say, when I when I um, was conscripted, the national service period at the time was 12 months. I'd barely been in two or three months when it was increased to 18 months. Um, I was hoping to go to university in England, um, and I'd been accept accepted by a couple of universities. And England, I think, they start in September, the, the, the university year. So I was hoping to get an exemption. So I'd do nine months in the Rhodesian, Rhodesian Army and get an exemption to go to university overseas which was not uncommon, so it, I could have done it. Um, then it was increased to 18 months, and they said, well, too bad. You can do your 18 months, and you go to university the following September. Um, but at the time, I kind of, when I did sign up, um, I'd just been paratrained, and um, our, we were the second para course um, in the RLI, so we were sort of right up at the front there, and it was... We were quite a glamorous kind of um, role we were undertaking. And um, I thought, well, I've been paratrained. I'm becoming um, used to the war. I'm actually quite enjoying my time in the army. I was enjoying the camaraderie. And, uh, and I thought, well, it seems such a waste to become this para and then leave in a couple of months. So I decided, well, I may as well sign on for the three-year minimum period as a regular and get paid for it. Um, and of course, my back I was back paid on a regular salary from when I'd been conscripted. So it was like a whole year's difference. And, and the regular pay was, was generous, comparatively, compared to the pittance the, the Nashos got. Oh, question for you. Were the, were the black soldiers paid the same as white soldiers, or were they on a different wage? That's a very good question. I think they were, initially they were getting less, but I think by the time I signed on, they were getting the same. I think, I think, yeah, mm. yeah. Plus, of course, you got all sorts of allowances when you're a You get a, a star allowance. Each soldier was graded, sort of one star, two star, three star, five star soldier, um, depending on what courses you've done, what experience you have, and you end up as a five star soldier. You get pay increase for every grade or star. You get a parachute allowance, you get a living out of allowance out of barracks, you get a bush allowance, you get all sorts of allowances. So it was quite a lot of money. Um, that was a major attraction. What was the bush allowance? If you were, if you were, we're well, gone. What was the bush allowance? Is that, be, is that on ops, an ops allowance? Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I didn't realise you get all those, you get all those benefits back then. <laughs> it's quite well developed. <laughs> it was in Rhodesian dollars, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't quite the same, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was was good money at the time. Yeah, you uh, another thing that uh, surprised me in the book was the prevalence of not African people fighting in the Rhodesian forces, uh, British, uh, Australians, Kiwis, all sorts of people. Like people are out for get involved in the next up and taking advantage of it, kind of like, yeah. it seems to me, kind of like when people do an excursion to um, uh, the, uh, oh God, the, the Foreign Legion, yeah. you know? So what, what, what was that What was that experience with those guys like? Why were, what, why were they joining? 
Why for, did they come to find for you? For a variety of reasons. I mean, most of the Americans joined... Do you want to live here? Um, Okay, they Most of the Americans, for example, joined, they generally believe they're making a stand against communism. Um, well, how were they allowed to join? Did you have to be Rhodesian? No, 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 anyone could join. Um, and in fact, they're actively recruited. We, uh, Rhodesians had recruiting officers in the UK. Um, Soldier of Fortune magazine was a massive recruiting operation. We would just place adverts and then, and they'd all come and join, all these Vietnam guys. You know, Vietnam had just finished in 75. Or, you know, or earlier, and um, so we had a lot of Vietnam vets. We had a lot of um, Brits, Brit Paris, Brit SAS, Marines, um, Royal Marines. Um, uh, all, most of them, all with Northern Ireland experience, amongst other things. Um, so a lot of them came out. Um, they, they, they all like to think of themselves as steely-eyed mercenaries, but they weren't. They were just soldiers. They paid exactly the same as the Rhodesians. They didn't get any special kind of merc allowance. Um, but they used to kid us all that. They were heavy dudes, you know, mercs. <laughs> They're good guys. And uh, a lot of Brits, uh, Australians. I mean, at one stage, apparently, I was speaking to the CO once after the war, he said, at one stage we had, the Rhodesian Light Infantry had, could count 18 different nationalities in the ranks. And the many Americans, Canadians, as I say, Brits, and a lot of South Africans, because the South Africans, until their border war really got going, provided the bulk of the Rhodesian Light Infantry. Um, yeah, so they came across, the three commander particularly, um, I don't know why, but um, attracted the most foreigners, as we call them. Um, and at one stage in my little platoon, 11 troop, I was the only the only born Rhodesian there at the time. And I mean, I remember my stick consisted of a, a paddy, um, XIRA. <laughs> XIRA? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, we had a few of them. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they didn't actually ask too many questions about a man's background. Um, we, uh, I had a Scotsman, a guy called Nicholson, um, and then an Afrikaner, Tom Argyle, um, who'd been in the South African police. So, that was typical of a, a stick in, in three commander, sort of one Rhodesian, three foreigners, you know. Yeah. How old were you when you took command of the stick, of a stick? I first got command of a stick, um, I was still 18. Um, but that wasn't regularly. Um, by the time I was 19, I had my own stick full time. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of these guys were in their late 20s, particularly the Vietnam vets, and a lot of the Brits. Um, you know, they were all older, older people. Um, you know, they'd, they'd been around the block. Why did you end up in that position then, Chris? Um, well, a lot of them did too. I mean, um, but I, I think, I don't know, we were always desperately short of um, uh, junior NCOs and um, stick leaders. Uh, they, I mean, we, we suffered a 40% casualty rate um, in 1978. Throughout the year? Yeah. yeah, steady throughout the year. Um, so we were always losing people, or they might have been away on a course or on leave. But uh, Is that 40% across the whole of the forces? No, just three commander. And I imagine it would uh, translate across the whole of Rhodesian Light Infantry. Yeah, I don't know. That, that's an incredible number. I think, the, I, think the, I think in the Second World War... Uh, the 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 casualty rate was ten percent. Uh, if you average it out, across yeah. the Second World War yeah. was ten ten yeah. percent, one mm. in ten. Um, forty percent is huge. That's that is huge. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, but I mean, you know, by seventy eight or seventy seven onwards, we were pretty well in action, going into combat every day. Not always, but I mean, sometimes every day, sometimes twice a day. I mean, there's occasions where you heard of people going on the same fire force operation three times in one day. So the fire force would go in, clean up, do one operation, maybe not finish it, bring in the territorials or the Salute Scouts to finish it, and then get called out to another scene, sometimes directly from that scene, as we call it, to the next operation. Um, might be 20 minutes flying time away. It might be two hours flying time away. So... Yeah, it was it was intense, you know, and uh, it was relentless almost. And of course, we took um, casualties, so you know, forty percent. Yeah, yeah. What was that like? Um, how, how, how did you cope with that kind of that, that intensity of operations? 
or experiencing contacts, for example. Uh, that's that, that's uh, that again. That's another. That's another you know, unbelievable statistic. And I know where um, with the jumping, like you would some sometimes even like two, three, four jumps a day as as part of the jumping has been has been known. Um, uh, what, yeah, what was I like to cope with? And uh, especially from the mental health aspect, is obviously a huge yeah. uh, the huge focus on it at the moment in the British military. Yeah, are the after effects of significant operations where there's a lot of stuff going on. But I'm I'm quite happy to sit here and say absolutely like the, the pace, the intensity of what you're talking about. I only ever experienced that over a short period of time, so maybe weeks or months at a time. Mm. It wasn't the entire time I was so you know serving Afghanistan, I mean, the, the main one, the entire time I was serving Afghanistan, and yet there's obviously been a big impact of it. What was it like at the time? Did you, did you ever experience anyone that got in, in inverted commas battle shock where they yeah, just yeah. freeze, freeze, yeah. couldn't respond in the middle of a contact? How, yeah, yeah, talk about yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It was an accepted fact that um, we call it cracking up, um, and some of the older soldiers, the the the, the, the vets, um, who'd been around three, five years, you know, generally five years was about all they could take. Um, even even that, but by the time I mean, I didn't sign on again when I'd finished my three years because I knew, I just had a feeling that I wouldn't make it. I just had this deep down feeling that do not sign on. I mean, they offered me sergeant if I stayed on. And I thought, no, thank you very much. I've, I've had enough. Um, and it wasn't uncommon for some of the older soldiers to actually go to the OC and say, sir, I've had enough. I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. Um, yeah, I've been doing this for four years or five years. And generally they were pretty sympathetic and, you know, they put them onto some kind of admin role or whatever. But, yeah, it it was an accepted fact and it was never looked down upon that you'd cracked up, really. Um, some people never. I mean, some people could do it forever. Um, but everyone's different and it's the same as PTSD. I mean, some people never get it. Um, and they just cannot understand why others did. Um, and it's not the, the, the quantity, I don't think, of, of the, the action um, it only takes one, one episode that um, is stressful, one contact where you see something or do something that is really horrible. It only takes one. It doesn't take, it's not a sustained thing of a, a, a variety of, of, of operations. It's, everyone's different, as I say, and um, I certainly um, suffered. I mean, the, the way we kind of tended to cope was... Um, drugs and alcohol. Um, even even in in the war, I mean, every night uh, we'd come back to base and we'd um, it was it was not heavy drugs or anything. It's like the marijuana. Now and again, we'd go and steal the morphine out of the medics' packs and shoot up with that. But <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, um, but. Yeah, so, but generally it was, we'd get out of it, just totally lose it at night, and um, next morning start again. Not every night, but um, yeah, I mean, drugs and alcohol were one way of doing it. Um, the Rhodesian Light Infantry, I think because of the operations, had an appalling reputation um, back in back in town on R&R. &R. We just absolutely smashed the town what you, apart. What do you mean? Oh, you had, a, you had a bad, you guys had a bad reputation. Yeah, shocking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you'd be, so... On these op, just to sorry, you'd be going on your ops. You do, let's say one one contact a day. Let's say for two or three every day was different, right? But the generally speaking, it was high intensity, always like yeah, you know, always fighting, um, always at, 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 like significant risk of getting killed or injured. But when you were coming back in of, of those ops, you were back into camp, into normal. Like you could go out, you could go out that night. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. wasn't like operating in in a in a foreign country no. where you were confined to camp. No, you could get back and get on the lash after just absolutely being involved in some crazy incursion in Mozambique yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, generally, we a bush trip, as it was called, was six weeks. So you would do a tour of six weeks right, okay. into the um, forward bases, the fire force bases in the operational areas. Ah. Then after six weeks, um, you'd be relieved by another commander or by RAR or whoever who would take over the fire force, and you would then go back to barracks uh, in 
Salisbury in Harare for uh, two weeks or 10 days to two weeks, which was R&R generally, a um, little bit of training involved, but basically R&R. And um, you'd be, you'd have a few duties to do around camp, but basically you stood down and you can go out to town at night and do whatever, you know, and we did. And yeah, we were pulling. I mean, just trash the place, absolutely on the lash. Smashing the place. It's, it's no surprise, is it? Yeah. It's like the same as any any yeah. come back from any operation, I think. But yeah. the difference is the frequency at which you're doing it. So to to understand then, so you have, you have the barracks, then you would you would push into a, an area of operations where you were intended to operate. You would establish a camp, which a semi permanent camp, for six weeks. Yeah. And that would be where the fire force operations would be launched from Correct. against the guerrillas. Correct. Right. Okay. Right. Now those camps, I mean, they were main bases at. Um, around the country, Mount Darwin, Grand Reef, which was near Mtali, and then Buffalo Range in the southeast. Um, they were permanent camps. Um, uh, you know, they had um, tarmac runways. Um, they had uh, um, permanent barrack rooms. Uh, yeah, I mean, and then, of course, the blue jobs, the Air Force, you know, they had the swimming pools and all the luxury, that kind of thing. But, yeah, I mean, it, they were permanent camps. Um not all, uh, sometimes we'd be sent to an area where there was nothing there and we'd have to make up our own camp, um, tents, that sort of thing. Um, as long as there was a strip, an airstrip, um, or somewhere where the helicopters could land and a road leading in there so you could get the avgas for the helicopters, that could also be a camp. But generally there were main um, base camps, uh, forward, they were called them forward airfields, FAFs, and you had various FAFs around the country. And most of them were fairly sophisticated, as I say, they could take Dakotas or they could take um, jets, Canberra's and the, the Hunters, you know, they could also land. So they were significant operations. Is there any, is there any mission or, or, or operation that sticks in your mind as being probably the most challenging, the most difficult um, that you undertook during your time in the RLA? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> We were given an operation. Um, when I say we were on fire force, we weren't always on fire force. That changed. It, it, it evolved from sort of 76, 77. The Rhodesian Light Infantry at the time was doing half its time on fire force, half its time on patrolling, that sort of thing. Um, external operations, external reconnaissance type operations. Um, and I remember being sent, um, our stick had been sent into Mozambique. Um, to patrol what's called the cut line. It was the power lines that ran from Kaborabasa hydroelectric scheme, massive dam on the Zambezi, and serviced South Africa. So about 1,500 kilometers long, these power lines. And um, we were told we weren't allowed to do anything to those by the South Africans, although they were quite angry if we'd cut off their power supply. But we knew that the guerrillas used the cut line as a because there was a road all a, a dirt road all the way up the power lines and they used that so we were you could cut through the bush yeah, quite easily couldn't you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 so we were sent in um to really cut spore as they call it just um, got dropped off there do 20 miles every day with these massive bergen packs and 40 degree heat and that just took it, it killed us absolutely killed us but but cutting spore for people who aren't understanding what you're saying you're talking about tracking there right yeah you're picking up the ground sign left yeah. by gorillas yeah. moving through you're, you're basically looking yeah. at the ground looking at the leaves looking yeah. at the layer of land and trying to work out is this an animal track a human track yeah if it's a human track is it a gorilla track exactly you're going to spend 20 miles yeah. following the wrong flipping people yeah no no <laughs> that happened i, I mean the reditions they took a long time to actually realize that um, the regular, some of the units like the Rhodesian Light Infantry and the RAR were not cut out for bush tracking type patrolling operations. Why is that? I mean, we did it. We, 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 uh, we were better employed being used in a strike force sort of capability in fire force or externally on external operations and leave the um, tracking type operations to the Salute Scouts, to the experts, that kind of thing. So... Yeah, but uh, until 76, 77, we used to do that. It was a sort of throwback from what we call the border control operations, where you got dumped on the Zambezi River and you got to look out for canoes gliding across the river at night, you know, with 30 gorillas or, you know, that sort of thing. So 
that it took a while for the, the, the high command to appreciate that and realize that employing troops um, like us in that kind of role was a waste of time. Um, so we spent two weeks. Um, we had a couple of contacts on the way, but more luck by more luck than, than any kind of judgment, where we just bumped into Frelimo, Mo, um, Mozambique uh, army troops, um, who were hand and glove with Zana, so they were regarded as fair game. And um, we enjoyed it when we had a contact because it compromised the whole operation. And there was no point in us... Uh, staying there any longer because <laughs> they knew we were there <laughs> i know the feeling <laughs> i know the feeling yeah 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 it's like ah thank god thank yeah. god my life's at risk and there's a big massive thing going on because it means once this is done yeah. if i survive I, I can get off the ground yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah and during that one particular bush uh, trip we'd done two weeks and our bergens were so heavy i mean we were carrying landmines and 60 millimeter mortar and mortar bombs. And I mean, you back it up against the Pani tree, you put the Bergen on the back on, a, against the tree. Then you'd sit down and wiggle your way in. So you're sitting in the Bergen and two mates would have to pull you up. You couldn't get up. And this is what they thought was, was going to win the war. Um, but um, getting back to that particular, and we had a very um, keen officer who thought the more miles we can achieve a day, the more successful we are. Um, I don't know what he was after, Bronze Cross possibly, but um, I was f fortunate enough to uh, get the only kill on that whole trip. Um, and again, by pure luck, um, and we'd stopped. At, we, I mean, the temperatures they were getting up to 40, 45 degrees Celsius in the shade. It was hot and um, no water. So we all had to carry our own water. You know, 12 to 14 canteens, plus this Bergen with water bombs and landmines <laughs> in it. And we'd stop for a break, a brew up. We got that from uh, from the Brits. They, they all live by their brew ups. <laughs> Cup of tea, you know, in the middle of the bush. And, it's not uh, changed, it's not changed. <laughs> Yeah, they taught us a lot. Um, and we stopped, and uh, I was sitting with the South African guy, young guy, making our tea. And I'd left my rifle again, foolish. Um, my trade craft wasn't brilliant, and I'd left it just out of reach. Popped it up against the tree, just over there, maybe about a couple of meters away. Um, so yeah, it wasn't within arm's length. It was No, it wasn't. Naughty, it, naughty. It, it, it wasn't. And. Um, uh, we were making our tea there with um, Harry. The, no, no, who was it? Um, whoever the guy was. And uh, suddenly, there's a face. I see a black face in the bush about 30 metres away. Uh, what? What's going on here? Who's this guy? And I could see he was military. He had a military forage cap on. And straight away, I knew it for Lima. That's, they'd been tracking us. Um, and that caught up with us and we me and my buddy we were on the extreme perimeter of the camp of, of our sort of rest place and I saw my rifle over there and I thought oh, shit <laughs> and this guy was meanwhile looking this all happened obviously in a split second so I said to um, Griffin he was the guy with me and um, he was killed that that next R&R &R, sadly enough in a car crash I said Griffo to your two o'clock look there and he looked and he went, what the? And I said, shoot him. And he put his rifle in, in, into his shoulder and click. Oh, no. Stoppage. Yeah. At the same time, the, um, <laughs> oh, no. So I then scurried, grabbed my rifle, and now the Mozambican guy, he's getting his AK. Because the Felimos are alerted now, right? Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. they've seen him pull yeah. the weapon to the shoulder. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and they're shouting and all sorts of things. And I managed to grab my weapon, and I just pulled it up, and bah, bah, I fired a double tap just in the general direction, and hit the guy right between the eyes, just dropped him. I mean, that was the benefit of that open-eyed, uh, open-sighted shooting that we taught over and over and over again. Explain that. Go on. It's um, when you don't aim uh, through the sights, 
uh, you use the rifle. It's instinct, and, instinctive shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We what was it called? Open sighted. Yeah, you use it as the rifle as an extension of your arm, basically. So it's as if you're pointing at someone, and you, you fire a double tap, da da. Um, and that we did through. You must have done it the jungle lane. Snap shooting, we call it. Snap call shooting. It. Snap there shooting. you go. There you go. Shooting. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we, yeah. When uh, it's one of the things, especially in jungle bush. Yeah. Uh, especially there, from my experiences, yeah, it's like that is that is what's gonna keep you alive because exactly. your engagements in the bush and the jungle are so much closer. Yeah. It needs to be instinctive. If you if you are taking. Yeah. It, well, you haven't got the time to be no. aiming and you don't need to be because the, again you're talking 30 meters there that is nothing if your snap shooting is on the ball if your instinctive shooting is on the ball that, well you're going to hit that guy <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> if yeah, you, yeah and it needs practice it did yeah I mean it, that that was out of everything that we learned on our recruits course was snap shooting was what saved the most lives and accounted for the most casualties I mean I think you must have done it when you go down a path and these figures pop up yeah, and that's the challenging thing about it. It's, yeah. it's snap shooting, it's instinctive shooting, but it's not indiscriminate shooting, that's which a, is the important distinction. Exactly. It's literally the most, the toughest thing you can do is, is to be able to, in a, in the instant, as soon as you see whatever you think the threat is, to confirm the threat yeah. as you're shouldering the weapon. Yeah. To confirm it as you're doing it. Because yeah. you don't because if you if you're going to employ that snap shooting, instinctive shooting, especially in counterinsurgency operations, if you're going to employ it willy nilly, not properly, yeah. that's how you that's how civilians get killed exactly. indiscriminately. And you can't do that. Exactly. Um yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm robbing you stuff. So no, on. no, well that was the end of the story. And then we um we went running after the um we got our mortar into action, thank goodness, because we got rid of a few bombs which we didn't have to carry. Was it fifty one? Uh, Sixty 60 millimeter? Was it 61? Yeah, 51's came in later, I think. Yeah. The 60. Yeah, it would have been, I think it would have been 60 then. We had. Yeah, I always get confused. Because the British military's gone back to 60 now. Yeah, that's what yeah. we had. Yeah. Right. 60 millimeter, yeah. So we got, uh, we got that into action, lobbed a few bombs at them, chased them for several miles. They'd gone. They'd got nothing. Came back and um, the Americans booby trapped the body, put a grenade under it. And then we based up that night, heard the explosion. Uh, so I don't know whether it was hyenas or whatever, try to have a go at the body. And then we were uplifted. You know, the whole operation been compromised. When you say the Americans, what do you mean the Americans? Well, one of the American guys in oh. our unit, you know, he, um, he thought it would be a good idea to booby trap the body. But they'd gone. So I, I don't think it was him coming back. I think it was a wild animal maybe having a go. Mm. You know. Yeah. What was, what was the closest you came to... Uh, to checking out index like t having your life taken there, there were a few times um the, the the closest was right at the end in about a month before i was due for demob um and i was carrying the mag um i think you guys call it the gpmg gpmg yeah the, in fact i call it the mag when i read you was reading the excerpt from your book at the start uh, i said i call it the mag yeah mag okay yeah, yeah. gpmg it is yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, jumpy as i think jumpy yeah, yeah. yeah the general yeah, yeah, we call it just the, just the MAG, um, fantastic weapon, and I carried that quite a lot of the time, um, and because I was, I was sort of on, on the road to being demobbed, I thought, well, let me carry the gun, I don't need to command a stick, um, you know, let the other guys learn the, the tricks of the trade, so I was carrying a machine gun, and uh, it was sort of early January 79, Fire Force, we, we went into a, a village area, rural village area, fairly um, affluent in terms <coughs> of Rhodesia. I mean, there were some good crops in the field, a very clean kraal a village. Um, and we went in there, and I just sort of gaily went sauntering into the. Well, there were sort of two rows of huts, maybe 10, 15 huts on each side of the village, with a sort of open area in the middle, which was a sort of communal area where they sat outside, did their cooking, that sort of thing. And I went, silly me, you know bang into this open area in the middle and I didn't realize what well, I did soon enough that um, there were probably about six or seven guerrillas right at the end of the crawl I think fortunately and they opened up on me and the rifleman next to me and that was that was I thought I was dead I really did I mean and uh, because you were in the open ground I was in the open ground yeah you know, my fault um, I didn't think to to go in taking cover alongside one of the huts or anything like that just sort of um, wide asleep, as we called it. Yeah, and that, that nearly nearly took me out. Um, 
a terrifying feeling, and uh, but it happens in an instant, and they were accurate. I mean, the, the rounds were all around my head, around my body. I felt like it was boxed in. That's what, how close the rounds were. And that night when I got back to back to base camp, um, I'd taken about four rounds in my webbing. Jesus. Either side. So one water bottle had been shattered. There was a radio b a battery in the other pack and a belt, MAG belt, that had been smashed. So yeah, I'd had <laughs> two rounds on either side. So how I wasn't hit, I don't know. Someone's looking after me. Anyway, we, me and... Kevin, the, other, the rifleman with me, I said, we scarpered into the shelter of a, of a, a grain bin, which is built, a grain bin is built off the ground on these tiny poles with about three or four inch diameter. And we took cover behind these little poles. And they were still shooting at us. They'd found us. They followed us. And these... Uh, and there was SKSs, there were AKs. I mean, we could identify the sounds. They followed us there, and it's it, real war story. But the ground was kicking up all around. And I thought, that's what we did. Then suddenly it stopped. Uh, there was no firing. What happened? They ran away. Well, they, they withdrew. Why? Do they think there's because, more of you than more? Yeah, yeah. Well, they knew the helicopters were floating oh, around. They could hear the K yeah. car with the 20 mil cannon. And, the, you know, they knew that there was more than... It wasn't just us two of us. There was a whole fire force in there, which there were. I mean, my stick leader at the time was an American, and and the other guy was also American, but they were sort of like 50, 100 meters away to our right. So they were going around that side of the crawl, and we were going through the middle to see what we could flush out. And we flushed them out. They flushed us out. Um, and I was sitting there and through the smoke and the sort of um, the dust and everything, and I was sitting on my, my haunches, um, with the the MAG was on the ground between my legs, um, on its bipods. Um, not just checking the belt to make sure it was all okay. And then suddenly, through the other side of the crawl, I saw these figures darting darting away. And these were the shooters who were having a go at me. And they were running through a little mango plantation. And I, I couldn't believe it. They they were they obviously didn't think I could see where they were going. So I sort of swiveled the gun, the, the MAG, sort of firing it sort of on the floor like that between my haunches and opened fire. And I could see the strikes, um, and there were traces as well. I could see the strikes through the dry mango leaves, chasing them. Uh, but short, so elevated a diffraction, and they went down, all of them, all four, went down. I mean, it was just, just an amazing, amazing thing that... There they were literally a minute before trying to kill me and through just fluke that I got them. Um, yeah, so that MAG is a, a fine weapon. I love it. You, yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. I was fine the uh, Jimmy Gunner for uh, 2003 going to the Iraq War. Okay. And uh, I, I found myself and, and the two other guys, the three, there was, in, 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 we used to have three per platoon. I remember at the time, it was simply Power Edge at the time were the only ones using the GPMG employing it in the, at the platoon level significantly. And we would have one in each section. So every section of eight would have a GPMG. Um, yeah. And me and the other two guys, we still talk, I still talk to now and we still talk with it regularly about how, how much we, I mean, what a nightmare bit of kit, right? Yeah. Like, Christ almighty, because the weapon's heavy. I mean, it's a fucking machine gun. Yeah. The weapon's heavy, right? Um, it is, it is. That is not a weapon you can snap shoot well with, right? No. <laughs> And then you got all the ammo you got to carry with it, uh, but man, yeah. if I could go back, and yeah. I'd, I'd go, yeah, give me that, yeah. I'd, I'd give me that again. Yeah. And uh, and uh, did you ever jump with it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I jump, I jump with the GPMG. Yeah, but it would be, we'd strip it down. Oh uh, no, we did, we had ours fully assembled, strapped onto the side of your body. No. Yeah, obviously bipods in, and with a little bit of sticky tape over the barrel, stop it jamming into the dirt, and pull it into your. Your your parachute straps. Now I'm sure uh, I may be misrecollecting this, but I'm sure that we used to have to take the barrel off and take the butt off, and it would go into a weapon sleeve and get strapped inside the, the side of your Bergen. Okay. Uh, you, but you, oh, hang on, you're talking about jumping in assault in, in assault. Yeah. Um, yeah. Conf, like configuration, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah no. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. When we were jumping straight into action. So. Yeah. 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 I mean, oh, we yeah, even but... had the had the the belt in loaded, and sort of 
wrapped around. No, I never did that. Yeah, no, yeah, I never did that. that. I don't think I want to either. Yeah. Well, if I was, I'd, do, I'd give me an assault rifle, please, not the Jimpy. <laughs> yeah, but, and even the FN was awkward, you know, to, to jump yeah. with. It was so long, it's yeah. a, you know, length, lengthwise. But the, the Jimpy jumping in was not, uh, and, you know, if you landed on your right side as well, yeah. and, I mean, our parachutes were fairly primitive. You had no control over them. We jumped from four, five hundred feet or whatever, and we... If you if you jumped in a wind or onto rocks and you landed on your right side where you, your weapon is strapped, bye bye. Okay. You know, you know, every every jump we had casualties. Yeah, at least one or two broken legs or whatever. And that's another awesome. But when we got to start wrapping it up, that's another awesome part of the book. Is that the uh, yeah that that jump inside the operational jumps, um, ju- uh, uh, that whole insight into. Um, into what is you know rarely heard of these days in operational jumps anyway they happen yeah. um just very rarely but uh yeah mate chris it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you it really has um i hope we can do this again yeah um there's so much to talk about mate and uh, for anyone for anyone listening so in fact before we finish yes f- you've so there are people who have read fire force right and yes. they would have they would have i know they have co- co- so my old colleagues have read this um when it was the 2000 the previous publication right what has changed with republishing it what, what's not, not a lot okay. um a, a lot of the pictures have changed um i brought them up to date a little bit found some better pics uh but really just rewrote the thing and polished it up because uh, you mentioned before that the, the, there was some the, some of the i think in previous publications that there was some aspect there was some of this of your in, some of the original uh, that you wrote that was omitted from the original publications? The, the, the first first edition that was done in 1988, um, the publisher there, fairly um, conservative right-wing kind of publisher, and he omitted a lot of the stuff, um, uh, took it out, changed my style completely, and so come time in 97, when I republished it myself, I rewrote it, and then now this edition, I've rewritten it again, just polished it up, but pretty well the same story. Mm. It's, yeah. inc- it's, it's an incredible book, and it, Amazon, obviously. Yeah. And then uh, that's the main point, point to get it, right? It is, yeah. Amazon, mate, yeah, incredible yeah. book. So I, I highly recommend people, if, you're, if, if you've enjoyed listening to Chris talk, um, then um, get, pick up the book. If I pick up the book anyway, it's a fucking incredible read. And and much, you know, you can hear from you talking now, you know, it's, it's not, you're not, uh, yeah, what's the word? You're not dressing anything up. It's completely open and honest account of your experiences of water time. Yeah. Um, so thank yeah. you, mate. Thank you for thank you. today, and thank you for, for the for writing the flipping book. It is incredible. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, anything else you want to mention before no, we finish? I'm, no, I'm good. Uh, brilliant. Thank thank you. You. Yeah. Do it again. Cheers, mate.